ओम साई श्री साई जय साई ओम ओम साई श्री साई जय साई ओम ओम साई श्री साई जय साई ओम इट्स ऑलवेज द ग्रेटेस्ट ऑनर टू बी पार्ट ऑफ समथिंग स्पिरिचुअल पार्ट ऑफ समथिंग दैट स्वामी इज सेट आउट दिस दिस होल आई ऑलवेज थिंक ऑफ स्वामी सेटिंग आउट दिस uh energy of spirituality into our lives um i don't know about you but when i think of occasionally i think of what would have happened if i didn't come into his fold or if i had not known who he was um life would have been so very very different and therefore it is uh, that's why it's an honor to be part of this i i realize now uh that looking back it would have been different but not in a not necessarily in a good way life has been so so enriching and so empowering um it's just so much more to learn uh, that i have learned and we all have learned being in swami's fold so when you look back and wonder what would have happened if swami was not in our lives um we i can speak for myself i may not have gone into spirituality as much as i do today not spirituality as a subject but as a way of life as 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 i now understand it's such an essential part of living living in the consciousness that we are not just limited to this body uh living in in the knowing that um that everything that i've assumed about myself is merely an assumption a limitation and there is always room for growth and breaking free from those little barriers and every time i take one step towards breaking that barrier the universe takes a thousand more steps and helps me in that understanding and so that's to me that is what i have taken from baba's life and teachings and so if if i were to share something today it it will be something on those lines um if you are looking forward or, or looking to me saying don't worry swami will take care of everything let's just go back to our lives <laughs> i'm not one of those uh, i feel avatars come uh, they take a human role and and they set a prototype of what one can live we need a prototype we need a role model right otherwise it will be bookish knowledge we we hear about all of this but where is where are lives which have led that kind of a thing where has somebody proved what what can one do when they realize that divinity or know about that divinity then what what does one do with that knowledge uh to me swami's life is a representation of that it's a like, it's it's a clear prototype and to me today after being in swami's fold since 79 so it's almost uh, 40 years i think if my math is correct okay 45 45 years um it's uh, it, it's beyond a doubt that god is a very real concept god is a tatvam is not a being sitting somewhere looking down upon you it's a con- it's a it's an energy it's a principle god is a principle and if we and we understand that principle is very much part of our lives part of this creation we are not separate from that principle and that understanding translates itself into our thoughts words and deeds then um it is very empowering and so that is what i really take home from swami's teachings and that is what i always want to share of course his life is there his leelas are there his teachings are there his uh, there are so many things that he did which uh, at least for me my mind is still not even able to comprehend so i don't attempt to explain those there is you know like his leelas how does he do these things i don't know as a young boy uh, <laughs> i was 19 or uh, 18 19 when i joined this college in 79 um i was so curious to i was wonder how does he move his hand and create something for me that was like the biggest thing um and i wasn't cynical but it's it's natural right for somebody to say how does that happen out of nothing suddenly a object materializes um and then of course i had and had ample opportunity in the years and the weeks and the months and all that went by to examine every part of the so beginning from those uh now i feel they are silly but beginning from those silly little um doubts if you will that i had the growth has been phenomenal to 
to understanding who Swami is. So there are parts of Swami which I, I can never understand. There are parts of God, for example, I can never understand. And who am I? I mean, even the greatest sages um, like Adi Shankara has written that who am I to even, I can't even comprehend you, so how can I even pray to you? Katamakata Punya Prabhavati, he says in, in Saundri Lari. So, Shiva, you know, you, without you, nothing happens. Even, a, even in the slightest vibration doesn't happen without the will. And therefore, when I don't understand that cosmic essence of who you are, how, how can I even pray to that? Whom am I even praying to? So that's the kind of... Um, because the mind cannot understand, it's beyond that, you know. Um, the mind is dealing with data from the senses, right? We see something, the mind understands. We hear something, we taste something, we touch something, we feel something. And all of this, mind can understand, comprehend it totally. Uh, I can talk about uh, uh, eating a mango and experience of eating a mango. We'll all either nod yes or no or, or take a, where can I get this from and <laughs> go and get it and get that experience. Everything with the senses, the mind can relate. But when you go into the, into the realm of something beyond, like love, for example, um, not necessarily romantic love alone, but just any love, um, starting from attachment, which the mind just can't understand, um, a mother's attachment to a child. So from uh, our, our attachment to our phones, right? <laughs> so we cling to them, <laughs> literally. Anyway, my point is, from that extreme attachment to selfless love, it's all parts of love, expressions of love. E each of those the mind can't understand. Uh, and so when we go into love, for example, or faith, what is faith? What, how does the mind understand faith? It doesn't understand faith. So there is always going to be a conflict between uh, what we call it the heart and the head because the head is the mind. The mind can understand data, analyze data, go back to past experiences. It has got something reference points. But once you go into this realm, there is no reference point. It is based on trust and faith. What is that? It scares the mind. And therefore, we, we are constantly in this, um, in this swing, if you will, between the head and the heart. So once uh, a few of us asked Swami, why Swami, we are not able to get 100% faith in Swami. Um, he said, who says you don't have faith? Then we just said, Swami, our mind is... So he said, yeah, that is a monkey mind. How can a monkey ever be steady? Why are you trying to steady the mind? Why are you trying to fight with the monkey? Let it be. That is the nature of the mind. And he, he also used the word uh, example or, or the analogy of a dog's tail, a curved dog's tail. He says, y'all are trying to straighten a dog's tail which is curved. You can hold it straight, but for how long? You let go, it will go back to being curled. That a nature of the mind is to question, is to understand, because it cannot understand things beyond the senses. And so why do you fight with that mind? Open your heart. So he was the one who opened the door to, hey, wait a minute, I don't have to feel guilty uh, that I'm constantly questioning. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, oh, I'm not, I'm getting doubts about Swami or whatever it is. Uh, it's okay to have doubts, it's okay to ask questions, but after a point, we cannot answer all the questions all the time, right? If God is all love, then why are poor people there? Or if God is all, if Baba is in your life, why did he have an uneventful death in your family? What did he do? He protected X, Y, but why not Z? And, and there are so many such questions, we have no answers, and the mind gets confused. Because the mind is trying to put logic in its analysis, rationality. But you cannot really bring rationality because with every hill, there comes a valley. With every sunrise, there is a sunset. With every day, there is a night. That's part of creation. But how do we comprehend that in our everyday life? So with every time we smile, we have to know, understand that there could be a time where we may have to frown, <laughs> right? So Swami opened that door of the heart. In other words, of love, of devotion, of faith. And... That has been such an amazing experience and we can all relate to that as, as devotees of Baba and as, as people in the spiritual path. I think purely using your head only takes you to some extent, correct? Uh, even the scholar eventually falls in love with the God he's been studying as a, as a, more as a scholarly subject. So, Swami has opened so many doors in our lives. Um, so, so, I'll share some of that with you all today. But in the context of the larger spiritual lessons, we learn that he has come to awaken within us. I think that is very, very crucial. If we go home tonight or from any satsang thinking he is there, he is going to, take, he is going to look after me from somewhere up there, then 
then we need to ask ourselves, why am I creating that distance? He is not somewhere else. He is, he is part of me. I am part of him. And we have, to, we have to really, there is really no other way out other than opening our hearts so much that he begins to manifest himself from within us. It is so, so very crucial. And therefore, I, that's why I say that God is very real. It's not a, it's not a, God is not an idea. God is not a philosophy. God is not a, definitely not a religious being sitting somewhere uh, working a life out for you. It is the very essence of who we are. Uh, and to me, Swami's essence of Swami's teachings is just that. But all of this wisdom, if you call it, <laughs> didn't come down right away. It took many, many, many years and, and it's still um, baby steps towards that. Uh, when I was, like I said, when I was 18 or 19, I was up to neck with being raised in an orthodox family. So I really didn't want anything to do with anything more with religion or spirituality. Uh, because our outings were only temples. Um, I don't know if you have the same complaint. <laughs> or satsangs or or uh, Kata Kalakshemam, you know, they do the Radha Kalyanam in the morning and the uh, Hari Nama Sankirtanam. Uh, yeah, Swami Haridas was uh, one of our gurus. So every time he comes to Bombay, that's what my parents will be. Wherever he goes, follow him from Chembur to Matunga. We were in Mumbai. So all those places, some of you are from, so you can relate to that. Uh, and then Pitakuli Murugadas, another, uh, his uh, kind of uh, same same frame then he used to come and stay in our house so it'll be late night bhajans and i was literally raised in that i didn't i didn't um, resist any of those but then comes teenage right when you question everything uh, that's where we are lucky we don't have kids so we don't have to answer those questions but then as a kid i i gave i created help for my parents i think because i started questioning everything why this or why that or what is the meaning of this or that and they said as Allah and like you know we are we are this is how we have learned so this is we are telling you just do it <laughs> so we I belong to a generation where questions were frowned upon uh, we were expected to obey because they obeyed and therefore we were expected to obey and so by the time I was 16 or 17 I, I, I was like I need to go somewhere else and I was considered the black sheep anyway and I was not doing well in my studies in any case <laughs> And so by 16, I thought I'm going to join, I wanted to join the Pune Film Institute. Um, not as, I had no qualm, I, I was very clear about who, what I want. I wanted to be a comedian, not, you know, with my height and looks, I knew, you know, <laughs> because those days it was Amitabh Bachchan, Vinod Khanna, <laughs> you know, those, Manoj Kumar, you know, <laughs> and every one of them were like six feet and above, tall, right? So, I belong to Keshto Mukherjee and Johnny Walker. Johnny Lever? Johnny Walker. Johnny, 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 Johnny Walker is a drink, Johnny right? Sorry. <laughs> Johnny Lever, uh, Keshto Mukherjee. So I, I kind of like the com comedy part of it. And in my school, I used, I used to get some awards doing some drama here and there. So I kind of thought, okay, Film Institute is really nice. Um, honestly, I was going in that direction. I mean, I, I, w I would have probably have to run away from my home to do that because my parents were shocked to even think of that idea. <laughs> because for us, uh, I know many of you can relate to this, right? It was only studies, studies, studies. You do very well in uh, uh, games also, they'll say, enough, that is all good, but now come back to study. <laughs> You're very good in extracurricular activities, that's all good, come back to studies. So it'll always be study, get a job, study, get a job, study, get a job. That was like the booth savar ho gaya unko, you know, they say, <laughs> was possessed, uh, obsessed with that idea. My father had already decided, I'm, I, he said he's been, he, you know, in, to quote him, paraphrase him rather. Uh, I'm, I'm an accountant in this company. I've been with them from the very inception, Parley Biscuits. He was with them when they were in a small shed in, in Mumbai. So I've grown with them. I know the owners and everybody. So once I retire, you'll take my place. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my path was chosen and fixed. So just make sure you get BCom, BAM and study well. Commas, that's all. Maybe a couple of times in my fourth or fifth grade or sixth grade, I might have not done well in science, so they decided science is not for you. Commerce is good for you. Finish. <laughs> so everything was already decided, you know. Uh, and so I literally thought I had to run away to do something like this on my own. But then um, 
when I look back at these situations now, why do situations arise in life? It's because at some level, your inner creature is creating those situations for your own growth. It's not some other God or some, some unknown destiny for it. It seems like that, right? But it's not. It's like your own, your own inner soul, the jiva, if you will, the, um, the one that, that is going through from birth to birth, going back to that source. That jiva is is learning the path, and he's creating this. The jiva in me that is uh, that is playing the role of Sundar in this birth is creating those circumstances so that it can further the advancement, if you will. Uh, a, a simplistic way of understanding this, because you have jiva, you have atma, you have paramatma, and you have all of that, right? So the jiva is is, is it's something like you know if you, there's a pond of water um, that could dry up and that's very limited. That's like Sundar. Sundar is like the pond, but then the pond can overflow and become a river that goes everywhere. The, jiva, the river becomes a jiva that is going through hills and dales, birth and death, it's just going through. Sometimes it goes under the ground and then it comes above the ground, you know. So the river flows, that is the soul, if you will. In, 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 the, in, the, in the Hindu concept, if you will, I'm trying to sim simplify it, but just for ease of understanding. And then when the river... Um, mer is merging into the ocean, it becomes the wave of the ocean, the wave is the Atma, because the Atma is not separate from the ocean and yet there is a distinct entity called a wave, right? Otherwise you would have just said ocean. A wave is a part of the ocean, but nevertheless it rises from the ocean, but never gets separated from the ocean. So then there comes a part of us that realizes, my God, I'm not separate from this ocean at all. And then finally there is, a, there is just the ocean where even the wave subsides into the depths of the ocean. And then finally the ocean says, I, I am the ocean, I've always been the ocean. So in that, in that journey, this jiva is, try, is finding his way back so that it creates circumstances in our life, some good, some bad, but every one of them is only to further us towards that. So it just so happened at that point that my father got transferred from Bombay to Haryana to a place where there was no colleges, uh, they had did the, the parley biscuits, they were trying out something new. There was a toothpaste called, called Flash, if you know it, um, uh, for some time. They didn't do well, I think, but yeah. they closed, I think. Um, and then there was Crack Jack Factory they wanted to open or something like that. That's, that's why they said we want somebody known to be there for accounting. So they sent him there. Um, no colleges, no schools in Bahadurgarh, which was about 60 kilometers away in, from Delhi. So then the question came, how do, what, what happens to Sundar now? Um, I was like, go, 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 I can, my exit to Pune was much easier. But then, um, my 11th and 12th, I did it with my uncle. And that's where my uncle was extremely open and friendly, and he, he was also into a lot of spirituality, but he gave me the, the Vedantic ideas, he introduced me basically here and there, and introduced me to Shirdi Baba and and talked about Satya Sai Baba, but I said, no, 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 I don't, I'm not interested in all that. I should make fun of him, actually. Um, so in the summer of that, towards the end of my 12th grade, there was this um, summer holidays, you look for something to do, correct? Um, so we didn't have summer job concept, but then there's always people who would hire young boys. Um, and so there was this photographer in Bombay, in Warili, who, uh, who was looking to, for help because he was, those days color pictures were photographs, they were very expensive, correct? Um, sorry? Yeah, Sai Dutta. The color photographs were very expensive. So what happened, he would take a lot of black and white and paint them actually. So there was a special Fuji color, they used to call it, a special way to paint these colors. So there are still devotees who have those pictures, black and white, painted by Sai Dutta. Datta Mungekar was his name. And they have been family devotees of, from Shirdi Baba, they have followed, and they were devotees of Satya Sai Baba as well. And so he wanted help. And so somebody said, hey, you are, you are talking of painting and doing this and that, you can go and spend some time there. So some, it is very strange, I can't even put my finger how I got introduced to him, I went there. And um, he gave me some pictures, I started painting and I had my time, uh, you know, with him. And then I started painting Swami's pictures. And so after a while, I asked him, is there any other color? I'm only painting orange <laughs> and I, I deep red for the chair. And I want to paint scenery, landscapes. And who is this, by the way? Why are you got so many pictures about him? So he started talking about Swami. Um, 
like my uncle again telling me i said no i don't want to get into this i've been raised with bahut dekh liya humne i said as if i saw many people you know we 17 18 we feel we know the whole world i said i have seen so many of them no 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 i'm not interested not that i was against them it just that i was saturated with that i said nahi 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 i don't want all that they'll say do this do that no i don't want he said no no he's your kind of guru only uh, so i said what do you mean is then he gave me a summer showers in brindavan book 1971 or 72 he gave me a book and um, i reluctantly took the book i always like to read books even to this day i mean those days it was hardy boys and the five 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 find out five find outers famous five <laughs> and it blend we had like you know um apart from phantom and mandrake you know <laughs> okay so anyway so i i love books so i said okay i'll just glance through it I opened the book thinking there'll be some mentions of you know Friday do this puja Monday do this puja and all of that <laughs> I know when we, we now that we know Swami we know he's he's come from a much uh, you know a much different kind of awakening so I was reluctantly opening to look for that but there I didn't find anything and to my surprise I found statements like man is god service to man is service to god uh, religion of love I was like, "Are this is what I I really want to hear?" Suddenly, it kind of clicked to me. Those men, it was as if something in, internally clicked, just clicked. Uh, uh, especially being cynical, from, from I was looking to find faults, and I couldn't find fault with his any of his discourses. Uh, even his Bhagavad Gita, he was talking about Krishna and Rama, but in a very different way. He was giving us how we can derive inspiration. What are the lessons behind Gopika's devotion, for example, and all of that, right? What, what the idea of surrender and, and all of that seemed to be more empowering than creating a victim mindset. You know what I'm saying? He always ended up reminding us that uh, that the divinity is within us. So he kind of linked very beautifully. the puranic stories and and then brought it down into the advaitic uh, the field of oneness at that time i didn't know understand all this it just clicked so um i kind of went back to datta for more information and talking and all that then in the course of those 2 3 weeks i told him that how my pa- father is in haryana and i have to go to a college residential college i don't know what to do just as course of conversations and he said are you are going you want to college baba is opening one in puttaparthi go there it's a nice place you will enjoy it so my first reaction was no but then i thought you know it's a, it's a good thing to try so i wrote to my parents and i spoke to my mother, grandmother and my uncle and everyone um, my uncle was for it but then my grandmother had a big no my parents no 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 sai baba la adha lang kada no baba is in our family for us murugan is there shivan is there and so no sai baba and all we don't want you to go there and start you know they they thought to some cult but suddenly he'll go get lost somewhere and go off somewhere <laughs> you know kind of a thing because sai baba you know look at swami's hair i mean it's 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 a new style yeah. <laughs> we talk of branding he kind of came out completely out of uh, and we'll talk a little bit of, i know youngsters are here right so i mean that i mean all of you are young but there are some young a little more younger <laughs> it it always i i always go back to that because it's so fascinating how swami established who he was in in a completely different manner because when if every time we do something we always think what others will do what's the general trend let's go with the trend right but he broke all those rules and that's what avatars do that's why for me he's 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 so exciting and such a great role model when i say prototype i really mean that because that's so crucial so my parents and my family of orthodox south indian brahmin family they were like sai baba you you along no you don't want anybody like that apparently many years later they told me that when i was in the fourth or fifth grade um, I, there was some devotees from south africa who had followed pitikuli murugadas and came and stayed in our house and then they were on their way to see satya sai baba and somehow i threw a tantrum saying i want to go with them to see satya sai baba out of the blue <laughs> they said my god you didn't refuse to eat refuse to sleep you wanted to go to puttaparthi and i said i don't remember that they said no you you threw such a tantrum these people we don't even know who they are how could we send them with send you with them and that to you of all the people you know <laughs> and so it's strange i i don't remember that but later on my mother said uh, this happened but there was so when you go back there is some links that you know eventually begin to perhaps uh, throw light into this this relationship that flowered so beautifully there's always links perhaps goes even beyond birth 
Um, and so the first reaction was a no. So then that door closed. Then when I went and told Saidata, he said, go and tell them it is free education. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and told my family it's free education. Then what? Then go. <laughs> And my parents, ah, then go, 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 go. <laughs> suddenly, everything suddenly just disappeared. What, what is the lesson we learn from here? It's, it's such a powerful lesson, again, with Swami, that he opened doors for people like us to come in. That is the only way he could attract us, by giving something. So when you give something, you get a lot more. That concept of giving I learned from Swami in the years to come and in the decades to come, right? Today, I'm talking as if I knew that time. I didn't understand this. But just think of that. If it was only open to side devotees, then I, we would have not figured that at all. If, he had, if the qualification was to be a side devotee to enter into his fold, obviously, it's not going to happen. But how does, how does an orthodox people walk into his? He opened that door wide, saying, come free. <laughs> I'm giving you free education. So it, is, it was uh, uh, an offer too difficult to refuse. Uh, and so... It's not only that, it's like, you know, there's, um, th there are so many doors to his mansion, right? Then he opens a door of service. Okay, you don't believe in God, you don't do all that, fine. Just go serve, Be, open the door to service. People. There are so many who say, you know, I, I don't know all your Sai Baba thing, but I, I, I believe that you all are doing such good service. I want to be part of that, right? So many are still there, thousands of people actually. Because in this, it's perhaps the only organization where nobody really gets praised individually, don't get praised or all of that, right? It's just pure selflessness. Um, and so he opened that door. He opened the door of devotion by singing bhajans, uh, raising the standard of singing bhajans, brought in quality. Um, so, so in almost every, uh, and then philosophy and, and Vedanta, of course, he started writing Vahinis, which are so deep. Each one is like a scripture by itself. Uh, and these are all written by him personally, right? And so he opened all these doors. So it was like a mall. <laughs> if you you go there, you have you, everybody has something to do. We just say, okay, let's meet here. You go there, you go there, I'll go here. You know, everybody has something. A whole family can be Sai Baba devotees, but each one, each one can have a completely different perspective of what they as what kind of a Sai devotee they are. So that door opened, and that's what took me to Puttaparthi. Um, and then, of course, uh, so many things fell in place. Uh, w slowly, one thing at a time, and, and, and how he gave me admission, how he drew me inside. Uh, it's very fascinating. I can only look back and um, completely bow my head in gratitude because at every stage, it became clear to me that it was, it becomes clear to me now that I cannot take even an iota of credit. Um, so when I went to Puttaparthi, what do I mean by all this, right? When I went to Puttaparthi, um, I had to wait for my 12th grade. My 12th grade um, results were coming um, and I had met the principal. That time it was such a brand, it was a first batch, it just opened. College was very brand new in Puttaparthi, 1979. The buildings were also not done. The classes were held in sheds and Ishwaram High School. Um, but the college had to start. So he just said, let it go. You know, Swami never waits for ducks to get lined up. All right, something is there. Let's get started. Things will work out. So there's another thing. We always think of all the ducks have to be lined in a row. I can do this, but I need this. I need this. I need this. Otherwise, how can I do? We find an excuse why we cannot do. He has every excuse not to do it, but he'll still go ahead and do it. And then all of uh, everything comes into play. So Swami had already started off, uh, wanted to start it off that. So the principal, don't, there was no entrance exams or anything like that. You go meet the principal, he'll say, okay, give me your grade card. Or that's them, we used to call it mark sheet. So he'll see it and they'll say, okay, where, where do you want commerce, science? Okay, depending on your... Um. So, like I said earlier, um, I was not great in studies and um, I went to the principal and asked him, you know, I need admission and all. My father has, of course, clearly said, you have to go there, get commerce. <laughs> Don't. You know, that was decided by everybody. I said, okay, commerce. So I told him I want to get commerce. He said, yeah, sure, you get 60%, uh, that is A grade and above, in your overall, this thing you will get, I'll give you. Um, a plus is science, I guess, 80%. We used to call that 80%, 60%, something. Anything below that is all arts and all that. 
as if it's bad. I don't know, but somehow that was the <laughs> tradition. It was easy to get into arts. I don't know why. Um, and so I got my mark sheet. But in the, in that course of staying there is when I started meeting devotees of Swami. And then each one's story just blew my mind. He has woken up somebody from dead, and he has appeared here and there. And what is this unrealistic thing? This is not like the gurus who came home and said, Krishna did this, Rama did this. This is like, he did it. And for me, it was very difficult for me to grasp that uh, as a youngster. But then I liked Puttaparthi. Why? Because in 79, Shole was still very much in, in vogue, right? <laughs> it was still one of those nice... Films, are, it was still going on, right? So maybe 77, 78, I must have seen it. 77, I guess, I don't know. But, but 78, and then it ran for two years. No, it ran many years. Mm -hmm. But yeah, maybe 77, 70, whenever it came, I saw that. So the idea is that Basanti, village life, <laughs> the horse cart. <laughs> uh, when I saw, when I, my first tr entering as a, uh, the Puttaparthi, and I saw the hill there, and I saw the Chitravati riverbed, I was like, my God, this is like Shole village, yeah? I, want, I want to live here. <laughs> so it's somewhere, some film connection was there, I guess. So for me, the, the, the village attracted me more than anything else, village life. Of course, away from parents, nobody's going to breeze down your neck saying, study, study, study. So that part, of course, was the best part. The other part is the village. It's a perfect. And as coming from a city bred, suddenly this seemed to be like, you know, free for all. Um, but then staying with Swami and listening to all these stories were uh, unnerving in that sense. Like I said, even if 5% of this is true, then my life will change. Like, how do I know this is true? I didn't at that point. There was no way for me to get a personal experience. Everybody's shared their stories. I said, good for you, good for you, good for you. But what about me? How do I, how do I get my foot into this, this Sai bandwagon? You know, I wanted to, but I didn't know how. Um, but that was, while that was in the back of the mind, the first thing was getting into his college. First, get, let's get into his college, then I can stay here. Otherwise, I won't be able to stay here. My mark sheet came. Along with that, my father's letter also came. <laughs> and I opened that into my uh, shock. I had only 48% versus, or 49%. That one person matters, especially when you're way below, right? 49%, um, way below the 60% that was required for commas. And my father's, it, there was bold and underlined, I told you to study hard, you didn't, and underlined, come back soon and we will find out something. So for me, it was, it was dreadful to see that letter. Uh, to see my marks and to also think of the possibility of going back. Um, because my cousin, who's just three months older to me, who studied with me, he got 85% and all. So you can imagine how the family will be. <laughs> They'll both stayed together, studied together. What is this, you know? I was raised like that, compare it. Comp I was raised like that. I'm not finding fault. It was just how it was. I mean, we all can relate to our generation. Um, and so anyway, I dreaded the idea of going back. So that was my first, my thing was, where do I go to? And so I went to the principal. I told him, please give me commas. Somehow you please, you know how we can, <laughs> as a young boy, just please, sir, please, sir, do something, sir. He said, see, my boy, I know. Um, Giridhi, you know Principal Narendra Nath, right? Yeah. So very wonderful. Not Principal Narendra Nath. Um, uh, uh, gosh, I forget his name. He was Brindavan. Um, anyway, I'll get his name sometime. Shastri. Uh, is, so anyway, so he said, boy, I, I understand, but Swami has given me strict instruction. I have to follow his instruction. 60% if you have, I'll give you commas. You can come for arts, I'll give you arts. I said, that won't work for me. I can't go back and tell my father I'm doing uh, arts or history or something. It just won't work. And so for the first time, it hit me that I may have to go back. And so my devotion began with anger. <laughs> so if you will, I got angry. He said, Kya, Baba, everybody talks something about you. And now before I put my foot in itself, you are sending me away. Or not you are sending me away. I am being you know, asked to go away. So I didn't know how to pray to him, right? I'm, I'm talking of a heart-to-heart -heart connection. Like though I sat in bhajans and sang all that, but for my heart was not in it. So how do I pray to him? How does he know I'm praying to him? Should I give him a letter? What should I do? And so... It became anger in the sense, I have to go now. 
so my father had already sent the return tickets also aa jao so i had to go back i said okay then i wrote a very nasty letter to swami um because i had that amita bachan thing right i am not i am going to look into zai's give him and go kya baba and all they talk and all and for me i was you know as a youngster be i, I don't know about you all but at least for me i was looking for an excuse to blame somebody else for my situation <laughs> so now i thought he should have he can give me if he wants admission you know so i was very angry i wrote a letters even that i remember distinctly in that letter i said from this time the moment you take this letter we are done i have no baba no god i don't want anything to do with this anymore so i had kind of completely sealed my own fate thinking that you know somewhere we are uh, we are running the show not realizing that the inner jiva is creating that path opening it and and that that growth you know that that growth into spiritual uh, is not easy but at every time when that it's like a, a, a snake sheds its skin and grows into a new one that shedding that creates a little bit of a friction and that moment for me was my one of my first earlier um friction i think before that i was with my parents this time i was all alone in that village trying to find some meaning in my life right mm, 17 18 so then I, this was the letter and i said i'll sit in the front give it to him look into his eyes boldly and then walk away um uh, because that's the best i could do <laughs> what can what else can i do so i sat to the letter i went at 2 o'clock in the afternoon those days there was no chits and all of that anybody you go early you can sit early there's hardly any crowd so there were probably about couple of thousand people that afternoon i would think i went early sat on the sands waited with um, my letter in my hand i saw him come out and he came and in my mind it was give the letter and walk away i've never had any kind of a any kind of interaction and until then anything and so that possibility of a direct interaction was completely out of my mind so i i put my hand out to the letter and swami came and his fingers were like this he came and and you know he picks up letters like this he takes most of them sometimes he just takes it like this so he came like this and held his hand on the envelope which was peeping out of my hand like this <laughs> kya <laughs> hai oh my god that first word uh, first time he spoke to me i i can never forget because these are the first words that came out of his mouth to me looking at me what is it he asked kya hai in hindi and immediately i was like oh gosh uh, swami admission 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 <laughs> um you know i went on my knees and i said swami admission admission college admission because it was already a couple of days the college had started Uh, and i was trying my best to impress this principal i had even put vibhuti and all and gone to him thinking thoda devotee ban ke dekhte hain you know nothing worked so i tried everything and he was actually avoiding me now so this swami and so when swami said i was like oh my god this is my best chance now you know the person right so instinctively the only thing in my mind was admission so admission admission and then in my head my son, my father's voice say become become be bold do admission out of god but i need to get become right then i said immediately become so i mean become admission admission become become so i said become 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 <laughs> and uh, there was a laughter and all that I, i'm like i what what does all this mean and then i i very clearly remember this moment where he he said be calm be calm he smiled then he looked at the principal who was sitting across the sands in the mandir and he just did like this you know like this he pointed or something like this he waved and he walked away and the envelope stayed with me <laughs> uh if there is any meaning to that i thought maybe because i had written that you know you take this letter and it's all over he said chalo isko i'll give him a chance <laughs> i won't take that letter so the letter stayed back um and he walked away and then darshan got over i went to this i i looked at the principal i went to him immediately after darshan you know <laughs> and um i said did you see baba spoke to me he said yes yes i saw i he he said be calm uh, yes yes don't worry come whatever you want i'll give you tomorrow <laughs> and i was so happy that i so that's how that admission into his college was literally an admission into his fold for me um even then i didn't know i would end up spending um, 15 years i didn't i had no idea at that moment it was admission i wanted i got into bcom chalo i'm in this shole like village now that's all kush that's that was that is how i i fell in love with puttaparthi first and then 
<laughs> Swami later on, much, much later. But that was my, my entry into his fold. And I'm sure each one of us have stories like this. Um, uh, we go back to the moment where Swami entered our lives. Some of us maybe have been born into Swami's fold, but then there is always a moment where you make your own personal connection. And the reason I share these stories is only because it's so important that we share stories and get inspiration from each other's stories. My story cannot be your story. My faith cannot be your faith. I'm not, I cannot even push it because that's exactly what my parents did and that put me away from them. But rather, with Swami, He gave me a chance to rediscover that faith. That faith in God, the whole idea of everything became a, a completely a fresh start for me. He gave me that. So it's so crucial for us is that we find our connection with the divine. Whatever form, whatever guru, whatever it is, in whatever manner that we can connect to our divinity. That is so vital. And once we make that connection in our lives, in our generation at that time, you will find that path beginning to guide you and, and strengthen you and empower you spiritually. And then everything else is, is immaterial, uh, physical strength, mental strength, and success in career, success in relationship, success, all of that. Eventually, everything will fall in place if your core is, is, um, is uh, in, incorrupt, if you will. If the core is confused, the core of us, then everything else becomes, is only becomes a reflection, right? Uh, and I, I draw this idea from Vedanta. Because Adi Shankara says, the only disease in this world is the disease of Agnana. That is the disease. Everything else is a reflection of that disease only. Whether physical, mental. So today we are trying to treat body disease in terms of body. Fix it. We are putting off a fire there, correct? I know I'm sitting in the midst of many doctors. Especially the doctor who is going to give me a nice cup of coffee after this. But aren't we just putting off fire? We are just putting off fire, right? We are not curing it permanently for the body. Then we approach the mind and try to pacify the mind. We're trying, at least we are now trying to understand the link between body and mind. So that's become an accepted thing. But the spirit is left out. But if the innermost identity is kind of corrupt, where we are without understanding or giving myself a time and, and space to understand what is my purpose in life, who am I really, what is my inner calling, I assume a role, I assume an identity, I assume a religion belongs to me, I assume a faith and I just borrow ideas from everybody and, and start living a borrowed idea. Why do we all laugh at the same joke? Why do we feel jokes should be like this? Why do we all feel black and white films are now boring? Because we are living on borrowed ideas, we have convinced each other about it, right? And so we are living on borrowed ideas, borrowed principles, and then imagine a whole life is spent on borrowed ideas. Where is my calling? What do, what do I want to do in life? Oh, no, no, no. Everybody your age is doing this. You have to do it. Oh, maybe I have to do it. I feel the pressure. Right? And so with Swami and finding God is very different. So that disease becomes, eventually it finds its way somewhere. So the stress that we call in life today, the illnesses that we see, in individuals, in our bodies, in our minds, in communities, in, and in the nations at world. If you see all of that is only a reflection, all the conflicts that we see outside, you and I are all part of that conflict. We can't blame someone else because it all comes from that every one of us in that inner core is not 100% clear, right? So in, in the ancient Vedic Gurukulas, that was the aim. The Rishis like Agastya and all of them, their, their Gurukulas, their system of education was completely different. They, they taught you the, something that catered to the left side of the brain, but they also helped you develop the right side of the brain, the intuitive part of it, the meditation part of it, the, the power of sounds and chanting and all of that. They brought all that. So it was a completely holistic growth. So there was enough, and, and it was in nature. It was in respect to environment. It was not about how much money I can make if I do this course or what is my career. It, money was not driving it. What was driving is was, was discovery of yourself. And then what you do with that discovery was entirely up to you. Sudama turned out to be a Brahmin. And he was a happy Brahmin. He was poor. Same school, Krishna. Best classmates. Krishna turned out to be the emperor. Because he chose to do what he wanted to do. Sudama chose what he wanted to do. But people made their choices after living an enlightened lifestyle. So enlightenment is not at the end of life. 
I believe the Vedic culture was where enlightenment was right at the beginning. And then what you do with that enlightened understanding of who you are is entirely up to you. Then you live a life that is enlightened. And that has to be something that is all inclusive because that is the whole idea of that, of understanding that I'm part of creation. I'm, uh, the, the sun is not separate from me, neither the tree nor the earth. And today we are seeing that, right? That living that isolated separateness is causing us harm. It's coming back to us because nature is... If you are finding now drought in Cleveland is under drought conditions apparently. So this kind of drying situations or heat and all of that, we can't keep blaming one country versus the other. It's a collective understanding of consciousness where we are becoming more separate than unified. And in Swami's fold, it is always about unity, not just among people, um, but that is a reflection of the inner unity, that understanding that I'm part of this whole creation. This cre creation is not separate from me and that's very empowering right if i know that i'm a, a creation is with me then i have all the resources available to me if i can understand you tune into the earth element into the water element and so on and so that that is where swami went straight in in his entire teaching and his lifestyle he wanted us to go straight and and awaken that god principle in our consciousness bring that back into our lives and, that, that, uh, and that's why we are all here today, to, uh, to know more about Swami, to learn more about Him. And so I went into Swami's fold and, and then slowly one thing led to the other. I always say this, um, it was first curiosity. How does He create? What does He do? What does He do in His room? That was my next step. Now now the Puttaparthi ho gaya. Now I'm in love with Puttaparthi. My life has started. But then now I'm, I'm curious to see, I, I, curiosity began to really build up. Like, you know, everybody is praising, everybody is falling at his feet. I also would touch his feet and everybody is going by. Now I'm talking of my internal heart-to-heart -heart feeling, right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for that direct connection, guru connection, God connection. What is this? Um, what does he do in his room? How are people claiming him to be, you know, an avatar or incarnation and and powers like this. Does he shave? Does he brush his teeth? <laughs> Does he comb his hair? <laughs> what does he do? I was so curious to see um, or, or understand or know about it. And the more I would ask people close to him, they'll say, ah, it's okay, ah, nothing, nothing. All Baba, and avoid. And when somebody does that, you are even more curious. <laughs> Chupa kya rahe? And what are they hiding? Are they hiding something? I want to know more. Uh, how can you get into that room? That was my like, how do you go there? Um, I had to wait one and a half years for something like that to materialize. That one and a half years from 79 June till 1980 December, I was just one among the 50 odd students. Now 50 seems very small in today's numbers that you see in Puttaparthi, but still 50 was 50 students and, and 40 out of those 50 students were ch children, grandchildren of Swami's devotees whom they have known from Swami's young age. So from nearby Hyderabad and all of those places, uh, Delhi and all of that, you, you had, you know, all children raised in the Sai family. So I was not the only one odd man out, but there were a very, very few like me. Um, I had to wait one and a half years. That one and a half years was this turmoil going inside. How do I relate to Swami? Uh, why am I, so all of this came, this guilt complex also, why am I not getting the faith here? Everybody seems to have so much faith. I'm not feeling it. Um, though I had a lot of opportunities, um, Swami even, you know, he, uh, I think it was around that time where he said, uh, enough of all old people singing, I want young boys to sing in the mandir. So I was looking for, and like, like, like me, many boys, you know, look for any opportunity to go there, correct? Uh, why did boys learn Vedic chanting? Because they love Vedas? No, there was a chance for them to chant in Baba's presence. So yes, yes, I also want to do Veda. Because Baba will give them a, a dhoti, right? Was, and Swami will give Pad Namaskar. So some excuse. Why did uh, we get into sports? Not because we loved sports, of course we like. But then the main reason was, oh, we can get to perform something in front of Baba. Uh, maybe play a, a cricket match in front of him or a basketball. And then he might joke with me. Or Everything was done to get his attention. Almost everything was done. So we all, so when Baba said, boys sing, I said, okay, okay, okay. I, I also want to get there somehow, get closer, little, little, closer, 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 so that I can also understand who he is or he might know my name. 
Um, and I, I, I remember Baba coming to the hostel. Uh, this is a hostel. Actually, this was after 1980. So it did happen during that period. Um, but anyway, since I'm in that talk, so actually Swami came to the hostel and then he asked, uh, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to um, audition boys for bhajans. Um, and so there were about 12 of us who decided to sing in front of Swami. And Swami said, I'll choose. I'll practice and come. You'll, I, will, I will choose. Um, and so, of course, not all 12 were new. There were three or four excellent singers like Kote and Hirok and they were already there, so they. Uh, I'm talk, mentioning names because Giri, I know yeah. know them very well. I mean, so, really and they were in Brindavan in in Bangalore College, and they were very very good singers, established. So they were a part of that group anyway. But there were quite a few of us, uh, seven or eight uh, of us, who were like, I also want to sing. I also want to sing, kind of a thing. Luckily, my um, when I was very young, my mother had trained Sari Gama. You know how in India, girls learn dance, boys learn singing. Somehow, something, <laughs> especially at least in South Indian family, everybody touches upon it. Like, I guess China, everybody knows karate, right? <laughs> so it's like that. And a little bit of yoga, of course. And for me, all of that helped. Not dance, I didn't learn dancing, but <laughs> I learned. Uh, so my mother would sing well. So she would teach me, you know, Sarali Varsai and Geetam and all of that. Um, Though we would resist, but nevertheless, it was evening, afternoon time, you have to sit and practice. That paid off here in the sense, I didn't know how to start on Shruti. I didn't understand all this. But if I would start singing, at least my basic Shruti will be maintained and, and the Talam will be there. I think that, and that is crucial for singing, right? Otherwise, it'll, what's the difference between singing and chanting? Swami listened to all of us. Swami said, okay, tomorrow I'll give the result. I will think about it. <laughs> my God, it was like... <laughs> He left us in the lurch, if you will, and he went off. And then we were, of course, all of us were keeping our fingers crossed. And, and that time, um, Mr. Nityanand was a warden. So we used to ask him, sir, did Swami tell anything in the night? He said, no, no, I did Swami don't. He said he'll announce tomorrow. So what, what kind of announcement will it be? Like, oh my gosh, what do I sh do if I don't get selected? And, you know, every one of us had our own little cons. Only, see, some of this, the, 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 the motivations here were, uh, and again, I can speak for myself. It is about bhajan singers. I can get to sit in the front, close to Swami's chair. I get to sing, Swami will look at you, you're leading. So, you know, that chance to get recognized by Swami was immense, you know. So that was so crucial. Um, he, and next day he came and so sweetly he said, actually all the boys sang well, so you can all sing. Oh. But you should all practice. And then he slowly started tightening the screws, you know, <laughs> because I was one of those like get into a mood today, Bhajan, I want to sing like this. I'm in a mood, but what about others, you know? <laughs> Later on, I learned it's not about you and your mood at all. It is about, it's a service. You're singing and others are following. Don't let your personal emotions get in the way. I remember once uh, one boy sang, uh, Anata Bando Sai Prabho, Aparata Kshama Karo, right? It's a nice Bhajan. But boys generally don't sing it. You know why? Because after that, Swami came and told this boy, and he's a very good singer. And so he came and told him next day, quietly like this, just so that a few of us can listen. He said, Acha gaya, you sing very well. But tomorrow when you want to sing, you sing this in the bathroom. <laughs> you sing, I will listen. Because you're feeling guilty, why are you asking everybody? Sabne aparad nahi kiya. <laughs> Why are you singing in the mic so that everybody also has to ask for forgiveness because of your, somewhere you are feeling it. So it's, he brought that idea that this is not about you and me. I didn't give you the mic and a chance to sing because you can show off your devotion. It is about, it's a service you are doing. So that people, later on Swami would explain to us in the course of many discourses and all that. Uh, where you have to make people forget their problem, not remind them of their problem. You come and sing a nice raga for you. You're not singing here to show off your talent. So if you show a small bhajan, and a slow bhajan and you drag it around, people are going to get reminded of their problem, they'll cry. And here's the funny part, you know, Swami would say, you're looking at me, I'm looking at devotees' faces, sitting on the chair. <laughs> when you sing like this, I see their faces all drooping, <laughs> droopy faces. I want them to, see, I want to see joyful faces. So chant the name of God so in, in such a way that they will forget their problem. I want that to happen. And so important, right? 
So when we have a mic and we say, today I want to sing bhajan, ask, what is my, when am I singing? Towards the end, and Swami would always like fast, fast bhajan, right? Towards the end, I have made up my mind to sing a slow bhajan and in the end, I will start singing. He Vishwanath, He Gaurinath. I might be the best singer, but still the whole bhajan tempo goes down, right? In the end, it should be Shivaya Nama Shiva, Shivaya Nama Shiva, Shivaya Nama Om Nama Shiva. Oh, it's nice energy and then Aarti. So Swami would always give us that. Let everybody be lifted in that joy and that energy of that momentum and Swami's and the name of God. That's the power of God's name. He want, He He brought it into our consciousness and through us and he, through bhajans he shared that to the world. So it's so important that we, we offer a service there and it not as an exhibition of our talent. So that was a lesson we learned as we went along. But even that moment for me was not my personal recognition. I go back to my story only because at that point it was so important for me to get more to know Swami. So I would sing bhajans and I would start off my own like that only, whatever I felt like I would sing. Then Swami would make his face and turn around and I say, Bapre, I won't try it again. <laughs> so he started tightening the screw um, and slowly started a, a very, he, was, he would very clearly, and only boys will understand this, he'll very clearly exhibit whether he liked that bhajan that day or not. He, it will be us between us and him, the faces he'll make or the talam he will stop halfway or he'll just get up and walk away to apparently to see somebody there. But then it, for us, it'll be like, Are Bapre, I shouldn't try this again. Um, because with him, it was not about just training boys to sing bhajans. When the bhajans are sung, one thing I noticed with him was he would go into a, a completely different plane. It was, it was just Swami in that totally uncontrolled bliss state. Once he's sitting on the chair, he doesn't have to talk to anybody, right? He's alone, I'm God kind of a thing. He really would uh, enjoy that. And so for us to disturb that state would be a blasphemy. I should not silly sing something silly or do something silly that I'll disturb that. And for him, it will be literally a disturbance. You can see the pain in his face. Are, kya kya? Why did you do this? <laughs> what are you doing like this? So we to really would practice to to let him enjoy that. Um, there were times when, um, you know, boys like Hirok and Kote and all, when they sing, Swami would just literally go into bliss. I mean, uh, when I say bliss, not that I understand what that state is, but then watching him, will all of us will feel that energy. Oh my God, this is such a moment rare. Somebody is singing so beautifully and he is closing his eyes. So sometimes he is in the thick of the interviews and later on the devotees will tell. He'll leave them halfway and rush into the bhajan, listen to the bhajan and then go back. <laughs> because he can't stop himself. Um, that and especially our songs. Uh, anytime you call him, he, will, he feels obliged that, oh my God, my devotees are calling, I have to go. It's, it's like that. He, he related to every bhajan that was sung. It was not like, okay, they are singing bhajans, good, ashram bhajans are going on. It's not like, you know, a program that is going on in the ashram. He would relate to every single bhajan. So, when a darshan song comes, you will notice in Brindavan or Puttaparthi, I can say for Puttaparthi, he would come out of the interview room. The interview will get halfway also, he'll leave and go. If the bhajan is so captivating and so nice, he will just come off and sing. And especially there were some boys who would sing, he will just drop everything and come and sit, just to listen to that. Um, that, and that this is one bhajan is there. Ah, oh, 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 man, I knew Swami would love this bhajan. So on a Shivratri night at 2 o'clock, I said, will Swami give darshan if I sing this bhajan? <laughs> Swami, and I sang this bhajan. And uh, lo and behold, he came up. You know how in the bhajan hall you could see, he will open his bedroom window and come out and peep. And there he was standing looking down. Who is singing this? <laughs> you know, he came and he... I saw that I was so moved. Um, 
because every time I listen to these boys sing, um, because when you listen to a nice bhajan, you also want to express that. It's a natural thing. But then it takes time for us to be able to sing that well or somewhere close to it because we have to do justice to raga, thala and bhava in it. So it took me about 10 years to dare sing that. Uh, and it was 2 o'clock in the night, so there was no mics. So I said, Chalo, I'll... And so those days, we could sing an alap before the bhajan. So this Aho Mana Mandir Me, I, I, I sang and, I, and he came out. It was, it was, these were experiences where you're actually calling out to your guru, to your god, and he appears. Like, it's, it's inexplicable. Um, how, how does one even, even express that kind of, what, what happens in that feeling, in that moment, right? It's, it's a very divine moment, these are. So, um, he, he, in so many ways like this, he has shown his gratitude, his love, his acceptance of... And so, I, had, I found my way in the bhajan group and slowly started singing bhajans, learning how to sing in Shruti, made mistakes, but he was very gracious, very gracious and slowly trained us all into singing and there were, uh, as the years went by, there were better singers who came, like people who knew singing. Now the boys started coming in, correct? Uh, uh, three or four years later, uh, S. Kumar came from Chennai. Suddenly the whole level of bhajan singing standard raised because once a boy sings really well, every other boy wants to now kind of match that. So Swami, in a very beautiful way, raised the bhajans. And then boys became a, a kind of a, a, a um, a marker, a benchmark for everywhere else bhajans to be sung, you know. And then of course devotees caught up and now there are young adults all over the world singing amazingly. I mean here there are children who are singing so beautifully the other day I was there. So he, he has done that, right? It, only because Swami made that. If Swami had said, no, only your feelings matter, don't worry. He's met, he said that also very clearly. Feelings do matter. That is for people who follow, not that you should not sing without feelings. You pay attention to ragam. You know, he, he looked at the tabla boy one day and he said, you pay attention to talam. That is your job. He looked at the singer, you pay attention to ragam. That is your job. Bhava will come, then bhava will come in the devotees. I will enjoy bhava raga tala. So, it is a collective effort. I cannot, you know, so he plays, pays attention to talam and I pay attention to ragam and then that feeling is generated where all of us bask in that, right? It's, so that kind of a, a beautiful approach to bhajans, I think he was a trailblazer in that. He really brought back the standard of group singing, Sankirtan. Nama Sankirtana is one of our hallmarks of Sanatan Dharma because the sound energy is so powerful. Every name of God, Rama or Krishna has mystical sounds in them. The more we chant them, the more we make it interesting for us to chant. It is more powerful. It's not the raga that gives us the power. Uh, raga helps us to chant it more often. But then the more we chant ha and ra, hum and rum and and and, and ka, all of these are powerful bijaksharas, and uh, where the sounds, energies uh, release. Uh, the way I can explain this is. In our unconscious mind, because of our many births, we carry a lot of luggage with us. We don't know what's inside the luggage, inside that. We wouldn't know. Like when we pack, even from here to India, when we go, we don't know which suitcase, what is there. So somewhere there it is, I don't know. Right? So somebody has to open it and dig it out. But how do I know what is? what am I carrying with me? What kind of fears and doubts and apprehensions and mental blocks that I'm carrying with me? Some of them may be evident. Some of the, most of them are not. How do I do that? What do I do to reset that? Not that all are bad or anything. It's just luggage, basically, period. Okay. So the rishis have given us this powerful way of Namasmarana. Sing, contemplate, and these are the sound energies. They literally given you in a silver platter. Now, how do you believe it? It's not a matter of belief at all. You have to just practice it to release that power. And internally, it goes and cleanses that, gives you a chance to reset your blackboard and you can write, then you can design your life the way you want because now the inner backlog is cleared. Everything is cleared, you know, that's the best thing to do. And so that energy is given by Nama Sankirtana. That's why in, invariably we all of us, whatever, uh, and I've done this in many um, with Westerners who have no little or no inclination towards bhajans, they don't know. But when they listen, 
they don't understand the meaning they don't understand the bhava there's no feeling because they don't understand what it means but the energy the rhythm and the chant they all say like we were in bliss we were like we enjoyed this so much our bodies were swaying and we were like in total bliss this is why hari rama hari krishna movement caught on so much in the west pure name right what is this? i mean what did prabhupada um, give the west he just brought the maha mantra it's just 16 syllables there is no raga nothing to it but then he a simple chant he brought that into a rhythm and there is a youtube video of him simply chanting there is no music hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare hare ram hare ram hare ram hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare he goes on that's recorded for 3 hours i challenge you just put it on and after a while your mind will be in a completely different zone it's so calming on its own and it it even takes you beyond simply listening to a a trance like state it is just very deeply it releases something within um that is the power of sounds it's simple right when when we when somebody at the walmart says please sir please keep it back in its shelf sir <laughs> you know that they're meaning business but they're saying please they're calling you sir are they saying please sir please keep it back sir on the shelf that will be india store right <laughs> yeah that's it sir can you kindly keep it back now the words are the same but the way it is said is so the the mode of chanting the way we chant it the power the pronunciation all of that the stress where it is given just like it affects our language the rishis understood that and they have they come to the very birth of language comes from that essence of sounds and the stress that we releases certain feelings and bhavas unknown to us so it is not a conscious thing at all and that's why mantras become more powerful and and swami took us to a different level they said he said bring feelings and chant but sing it sing it for you why why not sing those names correct um and so that's why he sings hari bhajan bina sukh shanti nahi hari naam bina so that without this bhajan there is really no peace because that internal cleansing will happen so apart from philosophies i think in swami's fold we also learn ways to go into the spirit again this cannot be logically explained to a mind that is why in, in the world of spirit you have to trust and only practice right that's why abhyasa has becomes a very important part of whether it is yoga sutras or vedanta abhyasa practice uh, practice and start, uh, that is that is a key so just try out pick up a name pick up a chant and just go on and on and on and see what happens you will see that the energy in that sound begins to manifest in our consciousness there is absolutely no doubt about it that is what we call attaining siddhi in the mantra or the 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 deity becomes pratyaksha it just means that within you that energy is released so um and th- there is a whole science in it i mean this can be a whole different topic by itself because there are uh, each chakras in the muladhara which deity that what kind of sounds will uh, um awaken the deepest part of your subconscious mind you need a like an elephant to break through the jungle you need a ganesha to break through that is why ganesha lives in the muladhara that means an elephantine energy you need to invoke to break through your deepest recesses where the jungle is so thick you can't even know what there's no path there but for an ele- elephant doesn't look for a path right it creates the path so how do you create the path there out of that thickness then you invoke gang 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 see the word the sound of gang is not a, just a gong of a big bell that reminds you there but it it has power in it right is that heaviness so gang ganapati that's why the gang comes so they they bring gang into a ganapati mantra so that sound of gang 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 begins to go deep literally go into our subconscious and and release us from that and open the path so that then we can begin that's why we first chant ganesha before anything else Uh, or sing ganesha because we call upon that elephant and energy of our mind saying clear that path for me so i can now start seeing things clearly everything that is in our sanatan dharma is in our vedic culture is has got deeper significance it is really to empower us and to release us from our own limitations and barriers there is no doubt about this uh, we have kind of brought it down in a large sense and we made uh our cells somehow separate from god idea of god you know somebody tells us very beautiful story let me share that uh, as to the power of this um, understanding god principle being close to us so somebody talks about krishna when he was very young um, there was satyabama there was rukmini and there was draupadi 
in his uh, as a young because when Mahabharata took off, I mean, it went for many decades, right? When he was young, um, he was out there somewhere and he was eating some fruit or something, and he cut his finger, little finger. And so Rukmini and Satyabhama, his queens, immediately clapped their hands, started calling, you know, please, please come and help, and somebody help, somebody help. Draupadi saw Krishna's little finger bleeding, so she immediately tore a piece of a sari and tied. Okay, so that's one part of the story. Many, many decades later, um, she, Draupadi was being disrobed in the kings, in the court, right, humiliated, uh, and a sari was being pulled. So there, there are many stories in that lesson. One is that Krishna thought, it seems, Swami would say, Krishna thought, should I help her or not? <laughs> of course, this is, don't take it literally, but the idea here is, you know, like, um, um, I think it was, uh, I forget the name of this poet. He says, I shot an arrow into the, into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. Long, long afterward, I found the arrow still unbroke in, in, the, in an oak. I found the arrow still unbroke. So, you do good deeds. You don't know when it will come, but it will come back to you. That's the idea here. So, that was the lesson he was saying. That Krishna, it seems, thought, should I help her or not? Then Krishna was reminded, it seems, oh, wait a minute. When I, she tore a sari for me. So, yeah, you know what? All right. <laughs> and so, apparently, Draupadi, you know, the, the story goes that she was, she was covered with, robes and she was prevented. But there's another aspect of the story about the nearness to the divinity. Uh, Swami would explain the same story in another context. He would say when Draupadi was being disrobed, in other words, when she was in trouble, the greatest trouble, right, at that moment. We, we, don't, we, don't, we are not necessarily in that particular situation, but we are in situations where we are helpless. We call out to the divine. In so many of our lives, we do that. But then how do we call out to the divine is so important there, Swami said. Because she said when, when it started and Draupadi yelled and she said, Oh Krishna Brindavana Vihari. And I'm paraphrasing Swami's words. Brindavan, oh you, Krishna who is in Brindavan, please come and help me. No answer. Then she says, Oh Krishna Mathura Vihari, you know, you are a, you are the king of Mathura, come please help me. No answer. Then out of sheer desperation she said, Hridaya Vihari. You're so close to me, you live in my heart, why don't you listen? And then it clicked. It's such a powerful analogy or anecdote Swami pulls out to teach us. You call out to God thinking He's far out there, then it doesn't work. It will not work. He's made it clear. It didn't happen to Draupadi, it's not going to happen to you. <laughs> because we think, oh, you are there, Swami, where are you? You know, we like this drama, right? Think, catch ourselves when we pray and say, Yo, Swami, are you listening to me or not? Where are you? So we create this drama. In that course, we are actually establishing a big distance between us and God. Someday, Swami, I'll realize you are in my heart. We ourselves are told, someday. Swami will say, Tatastu. <laughs> the universe only says, Tatastu. So be it, right? It doesn't say anything. Our will is materializing. So if we make it so difficult that God is somewhere far away, God says, Tatastu. Okay, if you wanted that, fine. Be there. But if we say, Hridhi Bihari, you are in my heart. I know you are there. I know you are there with me. Thank you for that. And then he really becomes. That, that kind of lessons that we learn from Swami is priceless. Uh, and, is, and, and it's very easy for us to miss that. But if we hold on to those lessons and actually practice it when everything is going good, then when a trouble situation comes, it becomes natural for us to, to go within rather than suddenly become a victim and say, why is this happening to me, Swami? Why are you testing me? You know, I have done these mistakes and I've got really scolded by Swami. <laughs> there was a time when Swami said also, this mad fellow thinks I'm testing him. And he asked me also, where am I testing you? What am I doing to test you? <laughs> why are you imagining all this? The same Swami also said he tests. That's a different... So is, we had to understand in the context that we, we can't make it... Uh, he wanted... He, he wants us to get out of this, at one stage he wants us to get out of this victim mindset. At another stage he wants us to accept. So once we get out of the victim mindset, only we learn acceptance. That you do what you want. You do your part, I'll do my part. So learning to unconditionally accept is the highest state of surrender. And that's what uh, Krishna demanded of Arjuna, right? In the middle of the war he says, you want me, I will come. But I cannot help you, I cannot do anything. I'll just be with you. That's another, again a very powerful, powerful lesson we as devotees should, should really take home, correct? 
because we know as a story, uh, for those of you who don't know, there is Duryodhana and Arjuna, cousins, both are great warriors. They, they both come to Krishna because he is common to both of them to seek his help in the war. They are fighting each other, but he is a common man. So they come to Krishna. So Krishna tells Arjuna, what do you want? He asks Duryodhana, what do you want? I'm just giving a paraphrasing the story. Duryodhana says, Krishna, I, I want all your powers, your army, you have, you have so much strength, you are the emperor, so I want all of that, give me. Krishna says, I will give you that. It's a choice. You can have my army, you can have everything, but you won't have me. And if you have me, you will not have the army, you will not have everything. I will not even lift a little finger to fight. I won't do anything. I'll just be your charioteer. You tell me where to go. And Swami would say that the kings would press the neck in the, in the war. And then that's what Arjuna used to do that. Go this side and he'll go. <laughs> Arjuna said, go this side, he'll go. Um, but that was, Krishna said, give me that role. I'll take that role. I will not help you. I know it is easy for you and me right now as a story to say, yes, yes, of course, if I was there, I've also chosen Krishna. But do we, do we choose, do we choose that? How is that? In our lives, when something goes bad, do we say, I'm glad just Swami, you are there, I'm happy. Or do we say, why didn't this work for me? You have so many powers, why didn't you use that for me? We are quick to demand when we go out of the house, what do we say? Swami, please take care of my house. <laughs> so he's a watchman. If he's sick, Swami, please help me, cure me. See, he has to be a doctor, he has to be a watchman, he has to be everything. I mean, it's not bad, I'm just saying that we are caught in that, right? So as, as children, A for A for A is for apple, B is for bat. But then to restrict and say A is only for apple, B is only for bat, then we are stopping learning the language. A can be A, A can be A, A can be A, you know. So how do we move from that into that complete understanding? That you be with me, that's all I want. I don't want anything from you other than just knowing that you are with me. That is a true test of our devotion, if we want to be like Arjuna. So when that, these stories in Mahabharata and in the Puranas are to help us introspect our own relation with God. Am I constantly demanding that you do this, you do that? Even if I say, you, I'm praying for world peace, and you, you help the world, Swami, who are we to tell him to do anything, correct? We just say, you, the fact that you are there, we, we, have to, we have to celebrate God in our lives rather than wait for God to come into our lives. We have to celebrate the presence of divinity within us. We have to know that He is already there, right? If you wait for something to happen, guess what? We are always waiting for it to happen. When that waiting ends, it will never end. Why? Because we are waiting. We wait for self-realization to come. We wait for Swami's grace to come. We wait for something to happen. And guess what? The universe says, very good. Keep waiting. Tatastu means keep waiting. And so waiting becomes a reality. And in that waiting, we have this drama of devotion, bhakti. I will be like this only pining and yearning. <laughs> okay. But then that Mira pined and yearned, but that materialized into manifestation. That manifestation has to happen, correct? And she, the same Mira who sang, pined for Krishna, she sang Payo Ji Mene Rama Ratana Dhan Payo. I, I, I found him, I found him, I found him. With every single saint, whether it was Tukaram or Jnanadev or uh, Sopan Muktabai and all of them, these great Pandarpur devotees, they all found Krishna in their hearts. They were all devotees. So devotion also leads to enlightenment. Service leads to enlightenment path. So with Swami, the, the lessons are so, so powerful. It, 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 there are many, many, many ways he explained this to us, sometimes in course of regular conversations. And so, um, sometimes I get lost talking about Swami only because I don't even know where to stop and where to end. But uh, if you have any questions or anything like that. Uh, you, that snake, I, I, I watched that video so much, but still I want to listen again. <laughs> um, I just told him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this, the story of a snake is um, a story that has uh, uh, brought me a lot of humility uh, and also it was my first hand experience of who Swami really thinks he is. I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, please bear with me. Um, before I begin the story, I want to understand the context in which I'm presenting it. It does not matter if you believe in Swami, who believes in Swami, which big shot went to Swami, not, none of that really matters. 
what matters for me is what he thought of himself, right? And to me, this incident was crystal clear that he completely knew who he was. He was always established in that. And so his will, every word of his was a will. Would I have manifested then or would I have manifested over a period of time? And everything he has told me now in my life, I can vouchsafe that every one of them has found manifestations. To the letter, literally to the letter, it has found manifestation. Even if he joked with me, it's found manifestation. Okay, even if he joked with my father, he has found manifestation. Once I did a drama, I wrote... Anyway, by the way, that film acting desire was completely fulfilled with Swami. He gave me enough dramas to act and write also. And he gave me so much chances. So <laughs> that little desire was completely, overwhelmingly satisfied. Um, not only just act, direct. I, I played a comedian's role. Um, and everything, sab kuch ho gaya. <laughs> In fact, Swami went to the extent he helped me even wear a dhoti once. Anyway, that, those are all so many beautiful stories. But the point here is, he was so particular about what he spoke, what he did. Every act of his was a conscious, mindful act. How do I know this? Because of this one incident. Otherwise, it, we assume. Uh, and so the story is, uh, I'll, I'll keep it really short uh, because... There are many, many aspects to the story, but I want to stick to this context of Swami's word being so powerful. Um, I used to catch snakes uh, because I love them. I still do. Uh, they don't scare me at all. And so there was a time when I, uh, there was a day once I, I was finishing my yoga and I was practicing and I was coming back and I saw some villagers kill a snake and I was very upset. And I said, next time I see a snake, I'm going to just catch him and put him, leave him in the hills. I just made up my mind. I just felt it very disturbing that why should we harm those creatures and all that. So that led to my learning how to catch snakes. I started with little snakes. There were plenty there those days. So I used to catch them and then one thing led to the other. And before long, uh, whenever there's a snake, they'll say, call Sundar sir. <laughs> so Sundar, Sundar sir, Sundar sir, please come. There'll be, there's a snake here. And... Um, uh, I began. I became the Snake Man. You've heard of Batman, right? So <laughs> I don't mind Snake Man. Anyway, kidding. So I became the Snake Man. Everywhere somebody finds a snake in the ashram or somewhere, they'll uh, call me. Um, and so this is one snake I caught in the afternoon. And just before going to that, I was. I had a distinct dream, and I'll come to that. But I went. I caught the snake. Um, by then, there was such an audience waiting, somebody with a camera. So I said, all right, let's pose with the snake. And this snake was big. I had actually, it's a cobra. And so I had to literally hold him like this rather than, normally if a snake is like this, I'll, I'll press him, his mouth like this, with my two fingers. Because generally, the face, the, if it's this small, I can hold him like this. But this snake was like this big. So I had to literally, uh, literally keep my entire fist on, on his mouth like this. And of course, he coiled around. And I unwrapped him and took pictures and all of that, <laughs> about five, five feet long uh, or more. And common sense would have been like, as usual, go up and leave quietly in the hills and just carry on with your work. But then that day, it was thoda josh mein hosh nahi tha. So, <laughs> josh, uh, yeah, I, I went a little cocky in my head. So, I took this uh, snake and I, was, I went up the hill. This is where the Hanuman statue is right now, on top of the Puttaparthi hill, if you know. Uh, that time Hanuman statue was not there, but the Krishna statue was there. So I went right up to where the Hanuman is and I would leave him there, right there. So I was about to do that, a group of students came and said, Ore, we saw you catch, we never seen you catch a live snake and we never, like, show us how do you catch a snake. We only see, is, see you after the fact and all. Now, all, that, all those days when I've caught him, I've caught him in my corridors, in the college corridor, in the hostel corridors. He was in a foreign territory. The snake was in a foreign territory. Right, cement floor, hard floor. So when you press, the stakes is pressed. Now I am his territory. I am in the mountains, sandy ground. I am. I should have understood all that. But you know, sometimes you just the buddhi becomes mand mand We say, what is that? Time there must be some. Um, it becomes mand buddhi. So it just stops thinking. So I was there, and I said, okay, I'll show them off what to do. I'll show. And so foolish it was that I normally use a stick to press the head down, and I catch the snake. This time I looked around, there was no stick. There were plants and bushes, but no big stick 
lying around there because no trees there, right? So I said, oh, okay, I'll just use my foot to press the head down. Why would I think like that? No, you know, the reason I'm talking to you, I'm thinking myself also. <laughs> what was I thinking? I don't know. I, I can't. So I held the snake's tail. I let go of his head. And then it cannot climb on its own body. So the snake is, you know, full hood spread. He is poor thing. He's, he or she is trying to look for the ground to escape. But I'm holding like that. And when the hood was spread, I thought I can press my foot on the hood. That way I'll keep it pressed and I'll catch the mouth like I normally do. I was wearing what we call bathroom chappals, you know, the Hawaii sandals, it's f the toes are all exposed. But again, my brain is not thinking. So I went and pressed that head. The moment I pressed it, it went into the ground. It, this is happening very fast, right? Because it is sand, it didn't stay pressed. It went into the ground. Now my foot is fully pressing. I can't lift it fast because my full body weight is behind that. So I put like this, he attacked and now my foot is there. And he, he gave a one solid <laughs> bite. He dug into my um, foot. This was um, 1986, I guess. Um, so you would think I shouted Sai Ram or Swami or something. No, I just said, ouch, <laughs> ouch, I said. Uh, the reason I'm saying all this is, it's I can't take credit for this in any. I you know I always examine this. There's there's no way I can take any credit for this at all. It's not like I shouted Sai Ram or I shouted a, a mantra manifested or something. None of this happened. I didn't. Um, again, I, hum I say it's humbling because I can do all sadhana and everything, but when suddenly a, a situation comes, how we react in that situation is an ex ex exactly tells me where I am in in my own spiritual progress. So at that moment, it was just a yell. That's all. Um, anyway, the snake did bite me. At that moment, I thought I will just go to the hostel and somehow my, my, I was in denial. Immediately, I flung the snake and I just brushed aside saying, as if nothing happened. My two colleagues they, they, with me, they saw it happen. They said, what happens? Sundar? I said, no, 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 it's just nothing. We'll just go to the hostel. Um, Denial. So I started walking down the hill. As I came near the Krishna statue, which was about 50 meters away, then my foot exploded in pain. That's when it, <laughs> it, it really hit me. Oh my God, this is serious. The pain just exploded, literally. Uh, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Um, it was like my foot was literally on fire. And I started limping. That's when I told my colleagues, hey, you guys come with me. We'll just go to the hospital. I, I don't think I should go to the... Then... Um, uh, Shiv Shankar Sai was there and right? he said, I, we'll have to carry you Sundar, you cannot walk, you're not supposed to walk. They were science students and I'm, I don't know anything about science, I've told you that before, right? <laughs> anyway, they said, I'm supposed to carry you, you're not supposed to walk. I said, carry me, I just now we took pictures and all. <laughs> so for me, it was, I guess, more of an ego thing or whatever it was, I said, no, 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 I'm just going to walk it. I'm not going to get carried and all, we won't attract any attention. So I literally walked, it took me a 10 minutes to walk to the hospital. That means my heart is pumping more blood. Now, a cobra, bite, a cobra bite is systemic in nature. It's not localized. It gets into the oxygen supply and cuts off the oxygen supply in the brain. And you so cannot be alive maybe after 15, 20 minutes, I guess. It took me about 10 minutes to reach the hospital. Um, and then the doctor was there. Yes, what happened? I said, snake bit me. He said, snake bit you? <laughs> you know, he is uh, Dr. Alreja was there. Tumku kata hai? Kidar kata? <laughs> you know, he didn't, very, he didn't believe. Then I, I told, I already told my friends, hey, my colleagues with me, when you come, hey, this doctor is not going to believe you. Tell him really we saw the snake. So we, he said, okay, lie down. And he measured my pulse and all. Then he realized something is happening internally. So I was also a little tired, ex exhausted. I was getting exhausted. And slowly, I think maybe my system was slowing down. I don't know. He said, okay, let's take him inside. And so I was lying down. He sent word for the, the antidote to be brought from downstairs. This is a small hospital then, okay, it's up the hill. Um, so I wanted to just close my eyes because I was maybe getting drowsy. I can't really think exactly what it was. So I told my colleague, hey, when they bring the injection, just let me know, I'm going to close my eyes. But before that, I saw some commotion happening. The doctor was getting a little upset and all. I said, what happened? He said, I'll find out and come. So Shiv Sai went, he came back. He said, Sundar, nothing wrong. You just sleep, don't worry. Somebody says, nothing wrong, you go to sleep, and I'm already <laughs> feeling sleepy, something is wrong, right? I told him what happened. He said, no, 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 there's that, uh, you know, the antidote is in the cupboard. 
A person who had the cupboard key has taken the key and gone for darshan. They'll get it now, very fast, don't worry. I looked at him, I looked at the clock, I said, if that person has locked the cupboard, it's a steel Almeda, small hospital, it's a steel cupboard, it's locked, the key is there. And if Baba comes out for darshan, you're not going to disturb him, we can't get him out. And I figured that for him to come at the earliest would be half an hour, 40 minutes. That's when I realized I'm going to die. So this is real because the, the pain was real to me. So then uh, I, I said, okay, so I, I told him, I'll just close my eyes and, and be, uh, you tell me when they bring the injection. So internally I was thinking I have to, I should, because I had read Walton, Walter Coven's book and all of that, seeing the dark light at the end of the tunnel and meeting, I was thinking, my gosh, I'm going to experience all that. I was more excited about death that time. Um, and then so I lay down, I said, all right, I'm, I'm, uh, how is death going to come to me? I don't know. And uh, make sure the chakra is, like, sahasrara is activated. Because I had done yoga by then and practice, right? So I was kind of into that. Um, and I was doing my best to relax. But I couldn't. As far as I remember, with my eyes closed, I'm trying to relax, but I'm not able to. Why? Because the pain was, I was very conscious of the pain. So that's, I knew I was conscious all the time. I didn't lose consciousness. Then I was shaken and then my friend woke me up. I, I looked at him and said, hey, you got the medicine so fast. He said, what do you mean so fast? Look at that time and 55 minutes had passed. 55 minutes on top of another 10 minutes which I had to taken to come. So I looked at 50 minutes and I said, there's no way it can be 55 minutes because I just thought it was five minutes for me. There was a, there was a lapse. I don't know when and how I can't explain it even to this day, what happened there. Um, I thought I was conscious throughout because of the pain that kept me very real. But then there was a lapse in consciousness. However, that doesn't explain why I survived the bite. Anyway, they came 55 minutes later, gave me the antidote and all that. And then let me relax. The doctor said you had to stay in the night. Um, and then by then my parents had heard, they were in the ashram, so they had heard about my... So they came and my mother was in tears. And my father kept telling her, Chullu, enna the That also he won't speak to me directly. <laughs> tell my mother, tell him to be careful. And she'll be like, why are you yelling at me? Tell him now. <laughs> you know that parents go hota hai. So, so that drama was going on. And then Dr. Alreja comes and says later on, uh, that Ayer, you really put me in trouble. There was no snake and all. You simply told me it is snake. Koi snake nahi tha, kuch nahi tha. There's no snake or anything. How can you be alive like this? And I said, what do you mean? Of course, we saw the snake, Koi, somebody has taken pictures also. I couldn't tell him too many things because in the night he's going to go meet Baba. If he tells him Sundarayar was playing with the snake, taking pictures, <laughs> I'll be sent out. So I didn't want to tell him too many things. I know you might say, but Swami knows everything. But those, that is a kind of unique place we were in. We, were, we knew the omnipresent Sai, yet we had to pretend to treat him as a boss. Uh, but so I, I said, no, 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 we're not going to give too much information to this doctor. So I told him, Array, we know it is a snake. And why are you telling like this? He said, no, 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 Swami himself told it is not a snake, you're just doing drama. I said, when did Swami tell this? He said, uh, then he explained that he went and told, when, he, when, when the doctor heard that I didn't have, there was no snake antidote available, he immediately had to do the next best thing that he could do in his capacity is, you know, when they escalate your ticket and <laughs> send it to the next level. He escalated the situation and said, I have to inform Swami that antidote is not available, Sundar is on the bed. That's his job. Because later on, Swami should not say, why didn't you tell me? You started taking decisions on your own, right? As a, His job is when there's serious things, even to the day I knew, to the last day I knew Swami, it was always reported to him. And um, so... He sent word, but how can he send the word? So he called Mr. Chirinji Virao, who was the secretary then. Please tell Swami that Sundarayar has been bit by a snake. He's lying in the hospital. The antidote is not available right now. That's all. Message to be given to Swami. So Swami has come out for darshan. And so he sees Chirinji Virao. And then Mr. Chirinji Virao goes to Swami and tells him, because in the when Swami is out for darshan, normally the office people don't disturb him. He is with his devotees. Again, like just like bhajans, that's a different energy of Swami we saw there. He will always be completely different. In darshan time, he'll be different. Literally, he's not, it's not a projection at all. I mean, I can't, I can't even explain this. If you ex experience this day in and day out for weeks, months and years, you will know what darshan means. He, it's not like, you know, he comes and sits and people come to see him. He would go out to people, right? And that going out to people, literally, he is, he'll be waiting to go out and meet people. 
for him it is like this is why i came for i want to be there out it was almost like that um and so it, it was a different swami nobody will disturb swami unless he calls off his office bearers and you know, the ashram people and tell them give some instructions to them hey this group take care of them or something like that then they will step out otherwise they will not and or if it is an emergency in this case it seemed to be an emergency so mr chirinjurao goes to swami and tells him sundarai pam karsindanta this is his words to me later on as mr chirinjurao explained this to me what happened so when in telugu he says swami it's, it seems uh, sundarai has been bit by a snake anta me the doctor has told me sundara has been bit by a snake so in the middle of the darshan swami gets interrupted by this so swami immediately snapped back quote and quote snapped back <laughs> eh I, that is not snake adi paambu kada adi urke mullu a drama chestunadu it is not a snake it is just a thorn that fellow simply doing drama and so chirunjuro felt foolish how did i to stop swami for the silly thing like kaadya bapre cobra bite means dangerous you have to tell suddenly swami said to like why did you disturb me for the silly thing kind of a thing and swami walked off for darshan so chirunjuro comes back picks up the phone and shouts at dr alraj i think what is this you didn't do enough investigation you asked me to pass such information to swami i got blasted from swami because there nobody wants that bad thing from swami it was it's a very sensitive relation with the guru it's like an amazing thing nobody can understand if 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 you're not being there as a one on one it's very difficult to understand that a little frown from him a little irritation from swami uh, uh, that you caused you, you feel very very bad about it right um because that presence of swami was like that even in his innermost room everyone around him treated him with the utmost respect in in a sense i felt he, I, he was a very lonely person because there was nobody like you know if you all can all go back i'll say atul chalo yaar baith ke aaram se thoda baat karenge i'll stretch my foot and relax kya yoga hoga baad mein dekhte hain you know or we'll watch a movie yaar let's relax i might say that right but there was no such moment moment for swami at all there was no such private moment where he could just the only private moments where he can really chill was with boys that devote senior devotee the older devotee will say are papam swami is with the boys at least he gets time to enjoy a little bit <laughs> but with us he was teaching us again there also it was really the most relaxed time was when he was teaching boys maybe but there was no moment for him the way you and i could say that i love my work i love my passion but i need a vacation to be healthy there was no vacation concept for swami so even in his innermost chambers everyone will not talk nobody will talk to him unless he initiates a conversation so imagine how lonely that is nobody is there to ask swami how are you feeling today did you have your cup of coffee baga tinara bagu nara you know we ask each other at least we say right somebody should be there to even ask you correct with swami you can't ask him like that right you have to just watch swami he will say how are you did you eat something so there that kind of uh, relation was with anybody even the closest uh, whether it was uh, like y'all know sachit satyajit was closer in my time it was radhakrishna was closer the closest to swami even they will tell you that 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 respect was maintained there okay so chirinjeev rao i got this from swami turned around and told alreja doctor that how can you tell me like this and all so in doctor alreja of course had to come back to me and say what you put me into trouble i have to go tonight to see swami and again this whole thing will become a big thing i was completely shocked how did swami at that moment right i didn't understand this how did swami refuse it it didn't make sense to me because there are 30 40 boys have seen this i have caught the snake the snake bit me and swami is just flatly refusing to believe that it's a snake nah, nah he's just doing drama what drama here i got bit i'm not acting i'm being bit so for me it was more i felt hurt like what yeah you could have at least waved your hand get send me some vibhuti or at least compassionate words something which we know and the reason why i'm 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 stressing on this point is sometimes we think god's compassion has to work a certain way and if it comes a certain other way we think it's not compassionate but that's compassion in its purest form as you will understand little later and as i understood 2 3 years later what this meant that moment what it meant that swami curtly making fun of the whole thing and making me as if it was a lie and it was the whole thing it turned it around it seemed that what is this i mean show some love i'm and i ended up staying one month in the hospital 
I was supposed to be there overnight, but then it became localized and my foot was swollen like a football the next day morning. So they kept me one month observing what to do and all of that and it became septic and anyway. That one month, being a bhajan boy, even some of us don't come for two, three days, Swami will ask those around or he will ask the vice chancellor or somebody, what happened to this boy? I don't see him at all. That one month, he neither asked about me <laughs> nor mentioned to anyone. So I had the vice chancellor who came and saw me, I had the registrar who came and saw me, the principal. I, I just casually asked, did Swami say anything about me? No. You want us to tell him anything? No, 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 don't want anything. I used to think, how come he kind of, literally, I was out of his consciousness, literally. Um, so this stayed, the, the wound was localized, I survived. So many doctors came to me and said, how can a cobra bite be localized? You tell me. I said, I don't know. You, have, you guys have to tell us that. I don't know about cobra bites. I know it's a cobra. We saw it. I got bit and all of that. How can it get localized and so on? So that riddle, if you will, was never answered or couldn't be answered in concrete terms. I tried to understand what, what could have happened. Was it my yogic exercises? Something must have caused it. I don't know. I was trying to grasp, like the mind tries to grasp at some logical explanation. How can a person survive a cobra bite for one hour before the antidote literally actually had to come? Um, and this is a big cobra, angry cobra, which I had in my hand and played. And so he was hissing and actually you, I could see when I um, held him for pictures, I could see the, the poison literally coming out of that fang, right? Anyway, no answers are given. So that kind of drifts by. I, I, I had the chance to write the Bhajagovindam drama then and later on Swami came for the practice also and saw the drama and I had my bandage in my foot even though I was a hospital, out of the hospital for a month. I was done. Swami asked the boys also, what is this guy wearing a bandage on his foot? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> they said Swami, uh, a snake, but Swami just, uh, this fellow is simply doing it. Like that kind of just dismissed it off. I heard about this from boys later on. So I kind of, that kind of story went off. Many years, two, three years later, Swami calls me for some drama uh, work and we are all going day in and day out. So that evening, uh, everybody, Swami said bhajan time. So all the boys get up and walk off. So I had a bunch of paperwork, you know, the days before tablets and <laughs> phone, we literally wrote dialogues and dramas in hand. So I had a big file. So I picked up the paper. I, I bent at Swami's feet, the last one to leave. So I backed, I, facing Swami, you go backwards. You don't turn your back to Swami. Even though the room is very small, you go backwards, correct? So I was walking back and Swami was sitting like this with his elbows on the chair. <laughs> then he looked at my foot. Hey, Adi he asked, what is that? What does that mean? There's a nasty scar on my foot. It's like a permanent reminder for me that of that incident, right? It's not healed fully. In other words, the nerve endings didn't heal properly. So it's, it's very sensitive, that part, even now. Um, so that's why I wear shoes as much as I can to just protect it. Otherwise, it's very painful when I hit somewhere. Anyway, so Swami looked at that. The EMTD, he said, what is that? Then I looked at Swami and I said, Swami, that time snake bit me. Eh. He smiled like this, like, look, like this, literally from... This sheep is my, okay, now come between you and me, like that, you know. Hey, pamba, pam kadu. You know, tell me, is it, that's not a snake, right? You, you're just simply telling me. It's not a snake, right? Pam kadu, kada, pamba, lez. Now, in that moment, I, I always tell the story, so bear with me if you've heard this. This anecdote is so important. Here I am, almost nine, ten years later with Swami, having understood his, everything about him. Um... I had a chance to tell him, yes, Swami, it was not a snake. That means I would have transcended what my mind believed and brought his idea of... Why am I saying this? Is because Baba would tell us the context uh, in a different context. Baba would tell us, why was Arjuna chosen for the Gita? He was a warrior. Everywhere he goes, he'll marry a wife and come, right? <laughs> he was a flamboyant, young warrior, handsome guy. Why would Gita be taught to him? There were great rishis. Maharishis were there in Krishna's time. That is, Dharmaraja was there. Why didn't they get that? Why did Arjuna, was, why was he chosen? And then Swami says he had only one qualification. His implicit trust on Krishna. That's all. Krishna tells him, you pick up the arrow and fight. I'm telling you, he would do it. That was that implicit faith and trust. 
So, Swami would even go to an extent of explaining that through an anecdote or an analogy, however you call it. He said Krishna would look at a bird and tell Arjuna, hey, look at that uh, parrot. Arjuna will say, a beautiful parrot, Krishna. Krishna will say, come on, it's not a parrot. It is a crow. It's a pigeon or a crow. And Arjuna will say, uh, of course, Krishna, it's a pigeon. It's a beautiful pigeon. <laughs> then Krishna would ask Arjuna, don't you have your own eyes? Don't you have your own mind? Why are you just saying yes, yes to what I am saying? It's very important here in that lesson. And Swami would say, Arjuna said this, Krishna, I trust your eyes more than I trust mine. You see truth much, much better than I do. And therefore, I trust you. If you say it's a pigeon, it must be a pigeon. I might be foolishly seeing a parrot. That level of implicit trust is, is what makes a true devotee. So when we call ourselves, before we call ourselves a devotee, we need to understand where we are. The reason is not because we need to beat ourselves, but that is a standard in which Sanatana Dharma taught devotion. And this is not some blind giving up your will to somebody else. This is trusting a higher wisdom. Trusting a higher wisdom is in place rather than mind. Because in all our decisions we make in our lives, where do we? We come from an agenda, what's good for me? How do we know what's really good for me? At this moment, it may seem good. Right? And therefore, we just do it. Because on the background, I, it, it, there is security, we say. Why? Because I'm afraid of being insecure. So fear is driving me. There's some maybe an element of greed might be driving a decision. Whatever an ambition might be driving. It's all very self-centered drivers behind that makes me make a, take a decision. Whatever it is, right? But there is a wisdom that is far greater that takes a wisdom uh, that takes decisions in a more holistic manner, which may not make sense at this point. Do I trust that? That is the idea of allowing Arjuna trusting Krishna is not, and I'm explaining it because we might tend to misunderstand saying this is ridiculous. This is not how we teach ourselves. We have our own will. Yes, you do. But trust that there is a better intelligence also at work. The intelligence of the universe of which we are a part of and we do not always operate, we don't have to operate from a small agenda. We can expand that. So, I have heard that story many times from Swami. And almost every time we would think, if I was in Arjuna's place, I would have also told Krishna, yes, yes, of course, of course. And here was that opportunity. He is looking at me and telling me, that's not a snake. And I am telling him, no, 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 it is a snake. <laughs> Imagine, what a chance I missed. I corrected Swami, in spite of claiming to be devotee and all of that and saying Swami did this, that, whatever, it is. at that moment, I, I, I clung to my idea of reality, not his idea of reality. Because it just didn't happen. This is what it was. Then he said, for you, it will be, it might be a snake. Niko the palm undochu, na note nuncha the palm ani eppudiku radu. You might think it's a snake. For you, it might be a snake. Not even you might think. Niko the palm undochu. For you, it might be a snake. Kani na notunchi adu palm ani eppudiku radu. I will never say it is a snake. Adi mullu, mullu, mullu. It is a thorn, it is a thorn, it is a thorn. Go, he said. So, at that moment, I heard this, I rushed back and I came into the bhajan hall and I sat and I was like, what did Swami say? What did he say? How could he deny it right in my face? First thing was like, I just had to process that. And then as that night spent and I started thinking, this is, that because I knew it was something very big, what he told me. Because that was the key to the whole riddle, which was always in my back of my mind. How did I survive that? Then it became very obvious that he willed it. At the moment when the darshan, he was giving darshan, when he heard it is a snake, he immediately, there was no time to make vibhuti and send it and say, go, papam, sundaraya, give it to him with my blessings, you know. That would have taken another 15 minutes to reach. And my sahasrara or whatever would have <laughs> taken me somewhere else. But that didn't happen. There was no time to show that kind of compassion. What really needed at that moment was change the whole idea of, change the whole paradigm itself. And that just needed a split second decision and he took it at that moment itself. He told Krishna, no, don't, don't even say that. It is a drama. It is a thorn and he is doing drama. He denied the reality of, of the senses of what really could, what we call real. He denied it. And three years later, looking at me, he's saying, I still deny it. 
because we might say at that time I told now I know actually it is a snake but who knows when he says now it's a snake that whole thing might come back to me now that will he de he refused to believe that it was a snake when in my senses and in my understanding it is it was it is a snake that's why I still am telling the story otherwise I would have told you nah, that was a false story but I can't I, Th that is, uh, so when Swami, why are we finding it so difficult when Swami says, you are God, realize it, this is within you. I am only a reflection of what you are searching for. I am not the one, I am a reflection of the divinity within you. My voice is a resound of your voice. My um, uh, resound reaction and reflection. Uh, and so everything that I am is a reflection of your own inner divinity. But what we do, we say, no, 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 Swami, you are everything. Because it's a comfort zone, we believe in our reality that we are separate from God. Even though God tells us again and again, every Vedanta, every Guru, every everything tells us to remind us of our own divinity. It's easier for us to go back to that state. Why? Because we are we are not able to trust His word. And that one extreme example was a clear thing that it does not matter. That that's when I began to realize it really does not matter if I believe in Swami or if ten people believe or hundred people. He knows he is God. I mean, he believes in his word. That was what for me struck me. I will not say, Na not radu, he said. I will never say from my mouth. It is a snake. But he also, you know, a few months later, uh, there was a blood uh, sir, donation thing. He had specifically sent warden to tell Sundaraya not to donate the blood. He didn't say why or what. Tell Sundaraya not to donate the blood, he said. That's all. You know, Narsimurti came and said, why do you saw me telling, is it because of the snake? I said, I don't know, I won't do it anyway. But that's, those are the kind of things. But he never on his, from his mouth said, he refused to say that, you know. So this is the power of Swami. This is what happens when you truly be established in your divinity. You know that every sound, every word finds manifestation. Even many years later, after Bajagovindam drama, Swami took us to many parts of India and all of that. And he meets uh, Mr. Goldstein from US, who was then the chairman or whatever, the head of the SAI organization. Uh, and he jokingly tells my father, introduces my father to him and says, this is Sundaraya's father, one of the pundits in the drama. You take him to US, he'll do good acting there. Let him go. He told my father, send him, send him. He a lot of, we can do everything there. And today I'm here, see. At that point, I had no idea I'm going to US. I didn't even uh, want to, I, it was not in my, even a, 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 a comment like that. So this, all this, my mother told me much later. In, I said, why didn't you tell me this earlier? I would have bought a visa long back ago. <laughs> she said, I don't know, I forgot. So when the time comes, she also remembered and tells me this, right? So it's an amazing thing as to how we are living with a guru even to this day. And so when he says, I am with you, he really means it. And it's a truth. There is no doubt. I am entene, gentene, ventene, kantene, unna. That means I am with you, in you, around you, above you, always with you. Don't walk before me. I am not your follower. Don't walk behind me. I am not your leader. Walk with me, he says. So, what a glorious statement. Can we then not know that this is the truth? And begin to awaken that reality that he is with us every moment. And I think if we do that, then... Um, We'll never have to look back in life. We'll never have to feel lonely. Uh, never ever. So may Swami give us that strength and wisdom. Om Sai Shri Sai Jaya Sai Om Om Sai Shri Sai Jaya Sai Om Om Sai Shri Sai Jaya Sai Om Om Sai Shri Sai Jaya Sai Om